In this video, we're going to discuss and demonstrate muscle energy for the ribs, specifically for inhalation dysfunctions. For each of our techniques today, we're going to be demonstrating respiratory assist principles. Something else to keep in mind, for each potential group dysfunction, we're going to be focusing our treatment on just the key rib. I'm going to be putting my hands on a few different areas on your neck, your shoulders, your ribs up here, the front of your chest here, the side of your chest, and also uh, down by your pelvis. You let me know if you're uncomfortable at any point or if anything is tender and if you need me to stop and I can stop anytime. Okay. Because of the predominant biomechanics of the ribs in different areas, we're going to be breaking up our approach to treating these ribs by different regions. So starting from the upper region, ribs one and two, we're going to start with a patient in a supine position. So go ahead and lie back. We're going to be sitting at the head of the table. We want to make sure that the table is at a good height and that our seat is at a good height so that we're comfortable. And we're going to make contact with our key rib. So if our key rib was rib one, we'd find our first rib by finding C7, T1, and then moving lateral until we find uh, the posterior aspect of rib one. And we can contact the posterior lateral aspect of rib one with either the pad of our thumb, or we can also use the metacarpophalangeal joint of our index finger to contact that posterior lateral aspect of the rib. From there, we're going to use our other hand to scoop under the cervical spine, and then we're gonna side bend the neck towards the dysfunctional rib and rotate away. We're also gonna introduce a force inferior and medial to bring rib one to its restricted barrier, which is exhalation. Once we've met the restricted barrier, we're gonna have our patient take a deep breath in. As they're taking a deep breath in, we're gonna provide isometric resistance. And then when they breathe out, we're gonna follow that rib as it moves into exhalation through the restricted barrier into a new uh, restricted barrier position. So go ahead and take a breath in. We're gonna provide isometric resistance. And when she breathes out, we're gonna follow a little more inferior, a little more side bending and rotation. And take another breath in. We're gonna provide isometric resistance. As she breathes out, we're going to take up the slack, move a little more inferior, and add some additional side bending and rotation. Take another breath in, and then breathe out. We're going to move inferior and a little more side bending and rotation. Again. And then out. Good. One more time. So we're going to repeat these isometric contraction and relaxation cycles for a total of five to seven times. Then we'll return our patient back to a neutral position and then reassess for somatic dysfunction. We can also use this position to contact rib two and we can again make contact with the pad of our finger on the posterior lateral aspect of rib two out closer to the shoulder uh, directly posterior to the clavicle. We do want to make sure that we are not palpating too posteriorly uh, and then landing on the scapula we want to make sure that we're directly posterior to the clavicle so we can still be contacting rib two. And we can contact with either the pad of our thumb or with the metacarpal phalangeal joint of our index finger. For our next rib region, ribs two to six, we're going to take advantage of the predominant pump handle motion by contacting the anterior chest wall. Because we're going to be moving towards a more sensitive area, we also want to make sure that, especially with female patients, that we're very clear about where we're going to be putting our hands. So I'm going to be putting my hands uh, along your upper chest. As I move a little further down, I might need your help to move your breast tissue out of the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if rib two was the key rib, we would make contact directly inferior to the clavicle and we would take our thumb and contact the superior aspect of rib two and then allow the rest of our hand to drape into the axilla along the contour of the rib cage. Now from here, we also wanna make sure to introduce a little bit of flexion of the head and neck and upper thoracic spine and a little side bending towards the dysfunctional rib to ensure that we're maximizing a restricted barrier. We can do this in a seated position, but it might also be helpful to stand up so that we can create more leverage. From this position, we're going to flex and side bend until we get to the restricted barrier, and then we'll have our patient go through uh, inhalation and exhalation cycles. Go ahead and breathe in. As our patient breathes in, we're gonna provide isometric resistance, and then as they breathe out, we're gonna follow to the next restricted barrier. Go ahead, breathe in again. We're gonna provide isometric resistance and then follow to the next restricted barrier. Take another breath in, and during exhalation, we're gonna be using our weight to accentuate exhalation. Go ahead and breath in, and then out. Do two more. Deep breath in, and then out, and then one more breath in, 
and out and following with a little bit more flexion side bending. Then we can return our patient back to a neutral position and reassess for somatic dysfunction. So if our key rib was a little bit lower, either ribs three, four, five, or six, um, as we're moving a little bit more inferior, our, our hand is gonna be entering uh, a more unsafe zone where our hand is more likely to contact breast tissue. So rib two would still be a safe contact and rib three is likely to also still be a safe contact. Once we're about to reach rib four, we're gonna ask our patient uh, to move their breast tissue out of the way. So I'd like you to use your left hand and just kind of uh, scoop your breast tissue down and to the middle, perfect. So as our patient does that, it allows us to get much better contact with rib two, three, and then rib four, we might be able to reach rib five depending on our patient's particular chest soft tissue. For my patient, rib four is about as low as I can go. Um, again, in this position, you'd allow the hand to drape into the axilla. You would flex and side bend to the restricted barrier. If our key rib was instead rib five or rib six, we would ask our patient to lift their breast tissue instead. So go ahead and lift your breast tissue up and to the side, good. And again, we're gonna be making contact. Now that we're moving a little further down the torso, we can move a little bit more to the side. We're gonna take our thumb and again, contact uh, the superior aspect of the rib of interest and then allow our hand to drape uh, into the axilla. So for rib five and then rib six. So if rib six was the key rib, we would again flex and side bend until we meet the restricted barrier for that rib. So now that we're moving much further down, we may need assistance in introducing flexion. So we can bring our thigh underneath their head and neck into their upper thoracic spine. And that'll allow us to create a little more leverage to introduce flexion and then side bending to the restricted barrier at the segment that we're gonna treat. And then again, we would initiate inhalation and exhalation, providing isometric resistance and following to the next restricted barrier for a total of five to seven times. And then we would return our patient back to a neutral position and then reassess for somatic dysfunction. Our next region is going to be ribs seven through 10. So we wanna have our patient in a fully supine position. We're gonna slide alongside our patient and we have a few options in terms of how we wanna introduce our motion. For one option, we can grab the arm and abduct the shoulder. Then we can make contact on the rib that we're gonna treat. So if rib nine was our key rib, we can find the inferior margin of the ribs, move up to rib 10, then move up to rib nine, find the superior aspect of rib nine, hook our thumb again on the superior aspect, a little bit more lateral, taking advantage of the bucket handle motion, and then allowing the rest of our hand to drape posteriorly following the contour of that rib. Now here, we're gonna introduce a medial and inferior force to bring the rib into its exhalation barrier, and then we're gonna pull the arm to accentuate side bending in the thoracic spine to that specific rib that we wanna treat. So we're pushing down on the rib with one hand and pulling on the arm with the other hand to introduce side bending just to the segment that we're trying to treat. For an alternate position, we can leave the hand down at their side, and again, make contact with that rib. and then take our other hand and scoop under the cervical spine and upper thoracic spine, just rest your head. We'll apply an inferior and medial force at the rib while introducing side bending to accentuate thoracic side bending at that specific segment. From this position, we'll have our patient go through a series of inhalations and exhalations, providing isometric resistance during inhalation and accentuating exhalation through the restricted barrier. So go ahead and take a breath in. We're going to provide isometric resistance. When our patient breathes out, we're going to accentuate side bending and inferior glide. Deep breath in and out. Good. Another breath in. Provide isometric resistance. Then out. More side bending. And then again, deep breath in and then out. And then last time, deep breath in and then out. And then we'd return our patient back to a neutral position and then reassess for somatic dysfunction. For our last group, we're gonna be treating ribs 11 and 12 and we're gonna treat with our patient in a prone position. So go ahead and flip over onto your belly. When approaching ribs 11 and 12, it's important to remember caliper motion during inhalation and exhalation. During inhalation, ribs 11 and 12 move inferior and posterior and during exhalation, they move anterior and superior. So now, to make contact with ribs in 11 and 12, we can start by taking our caudate hand and finding the iliac crest, then taking our cephalad hand and finding the inferior rib margin, either starting at the mid-axillary line, then moving down to rib 10, and then sliding off and finding the tips of rib 11 and 12. 
or we can start from underneath rib 12 and slide up and then find the tips of ribs 11 and 12. Alternatively, we can also start at the thoracic vertebra and then move laterally to find the rib. So once we've acquired our ribs, if rib 11 was our key rib, we have a few different approaches to contacting that. We can take our thumb, find rib 11, hook underneath, and then take our other hand and support it inferiorly. And then we can bring that rib into its restricted barrier in exhalation, which is anterior and superior. Once we meet that restricted barrier, we can then have our patient go through inhalation and exhalation cycles, providing isometric resistance during inhalation, and then following the rib into exhalation through the restricted barrier. So go ahead and take a breath in. The patient breathes in, we're gonna provide asymmetric resistance. When they breathe out, we're gonna follow it anteriorly and superiorly. Breathe in again. Breathe out. And in again, provide isometric resistance, and then out, anterior superiorly. Breathe again, and then out. And last time, breathe in, and then out. So after five to seven times, we return our patient back to a neutral position and reassess for somatic dysfunction. For an alternate contact that takes advantage of the attachment of quadratus lumborum to rib 12, we can use our caught at hand to stabilize the pelvis while we're introducing motion in the ribs. So again, if rib 11 was our key rib, we'd find rib 11, we can make contact with our thumb, inferior to rib 11, and then we take our other hand and we contact ASIS to stabilize the pelvis. If we're going to contact ASIS, we also want to make sure to be clear with our patient so that they're aware of where we're going to be contacting. I'm going to be putting my hand on the front of your pelvis on the left side. Uh, let me know if anything is uncomfortable, okay? All right, I'm going to put my hand scooping under ASIS, and now here, just stabilizing the pelvis uh, inferiorly. Now I can introduce a force anteriorly and superiorly on rib 11, and then have my patient breathe in and out. As they breathe in, I'm gonna provide isometric resistance, and as they breathe out, I'm going to follow into further exhalation. Let's do two cycles of that for demonstration. Deep breath in, provide isometric resistance, and then as she breathes out, I'm gonna follow only with my cephalite hand into further anterior and superior glide. One more time. Out into further superior and anterior glide. If that contact is uncomfortable for us or our patient, we can also stabilize the pelvis using our cephalad hand instead. So we can take our caudat hand and use the hypothenar eminence to find rib 11 and hook on the inferior aspect of rib 11, putting force anteriorly and superiorly. Then we can take the hypothenar eminence of our cephalad hand and contact the lateral and posterior aspect of the iliac crest to stabilize the pelvis inferiorly. And let's do two cycles for demonstration. Breathe in. As she breathes in, I provide isometric resistance with my caudat hand, and then as she breathes out, I move my caudat hand anteriorly and superiorly. Another breath in, and then out. And I would repeat that for a total of five to seven times, then I return my patient back to a neutral position and reassess for somatic dysfunction.